I'm Amy Luce. I've got my colleagues, Betty Johnson and Brian Stetton also uh, joining us on this. So uh, Whitney Harrington, can you start? Sure. Hello, um, I'm Whitney Harrington. I'm from Pecan Valley Centers in Weatherford, Texas, and I'm the project director for our AOT program. Yep. Oh, and of course I followed something wrong. Christy Hurst, please. Hello, I'm Christy Hurst. I'm the AOT nurse for Lee County, Florida. I'm actually here sitting in for um, my supervisor, Beth Gerbaum. We're glad you're here. Nurses Thank are you. Clinicians. Nurses are clinicians too. Huh. <laughs> Thank you. Tamisha? Tamisha. I am Tamisha Quinn from Genesee Health Systems in Michigan. Um, I am an AOT case manager. Yay. And, and new at the AOT case management position. I am. Excellent. Matt. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matt Coleman from Oakland County, Michigan. We are the county between Genesee County and Detroit, Michigan. Uh, we form the Northwest Detroit suburbs. And I am an the AOT monitor here. Excellent. Uh, I'm excited to see Tamisha. Yeah. Trish. I'm uh, Trish Mandacunas. I'm the program manager from Pinellas County Human Services. And so we partner with our agencies for AOT, um, just about two hours north of Christie. Excellent. V VNA. <clears throat> Can't hear you. Hey, what? We'll come back to you. I can't hear you. Wendy. Hi, I'm uh, Wendy Griffith. I am from well, I cover St. Tammany and Washington Parish Courts in uh, Covington, Louisiana, and I am the AOT uh, program director. Excellent. Welcome. Another new program. Very new. <laughs> Mary Frank. Hello, um, I am Mary and I'm in Houston, Texas. I'm the AOT coordinator with uh, probate court three for mental health. Um, we are located in Harris County. Excellent. Stephanie. I am Stephanie Hackney, and I am on the Genesee Health System um, in Genesee County, Michigan with uh, Tamisha. I am also an AOT case manager. Welcome. Great. <clears throat> Paige? Hi, my name is Paige. I also work in Pinellas County. Um, I work with the Public Defender's Office. I'm currently an MSW student, so I'm interning and working with them as a court liaison. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you, Taylor. Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm with El Paso County. I'm a caseworker with the AOC program. Excellent. Uh, Carol Stanfield. Yes, um, I'm the director of AOT services for Turning Point Community Programs and um, work with three counties who've implemented AOT. Uh, we're located uh, around several counties around Sacramento, uh, California. Excellent. And Leslie, not a clinician, but a fly on the wall today. That's right. Um, I'm a um, AOT champion. I'm a family member trying to get an AOT program established in Iowa. So thanks for letting me just be the fly on the wall. I'll sit here quietly. Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> I don't think I missed anybody. VNA, 
can you talk yet or? No. <laughs> Amy, Betsy and I should probably say hello. Oh, so I know VNA. <laughs> Um, that's VNA. She's our LCDC therapist here in El Paso with our AOT program. Yeah. All right, Brian. <laughs> Everybody, I'm Brian Stetton. I'm the policy director for the Treatment Advocacy Center. Uh, like Leslie, not a clinician, uh, but uh, I may buzz a little bit as a fly on the wall. We'll see, but uh, <laughs> good to be with you. Great to have such a great turnout. Hi, everybody. I'm Betsy Johnson, also on the implementation team. I wear the, um, the champion slash advocate hat on our, on our team, so uh, like Leslie as well. <laughs> All right. So aside from Mac, y'all, oh, and Paige, y'all are very new to AOT. Um, I'm curious if, if you could raise your hands. Oh, and Carol, Carol's been doing AOT for a while. If you could raise your hand of those that you are working with new programs. If you're new to working with those uh, with schizophrenia, <laughs> schizoaffective disorder. Anybody new to that? It's the only one. The rest of you have, have uh, experience with this population. That's great. That's great. I think that's really, um, not that those who don't can't be trained, but it's great to get into this um, program with that experience. So I'm going to throw it back to all of you. What kinds of concerns have you been having? Are you working on? Again, I know a lot of you have started but I'd like to hear how things are going. Everything's going great. Well, then I guess we're done here. I have a question for you. I know um, Beth and I were talking about that, my supervisor. And so I put it into the chat. Our question was when visiting a potential client for the AOT program at a crisis unit, is there a specific like evidence-based assessment tool that should be used? Something that like, if the judge is like, what did you, ba you know, we can't really tell them what their diagnosis is maybe at the beginning. Um, so her concern was if the judge asked, how do you know that this person would qualify that she has some sort of tool that, you know, gives a measurement for the judge to understand where she's coming from, why, why that person would be in need of being an AOT. So what do you all use to determine who's appropriate for your programs? Well, currently we have one, we have our first client we just got last week, so we're super excited, possibly one tomorrow. Um, we're basically using a referral from the crisis unit. Right, what about other uh, folks? I, again, I know a lot of you are new. Um, so what I did was I, I kind of compiled our own court assessment based on what some other people had and some resources from TAC. And wow. in it, I addressed all of those pieces from the law. And I sent that on to our courts and they had their attorneys review it and um, approve it um, before and they, they sent it back with anything they thought should change. But that's what um, we're gonna use. And I used it yesterday, actually. We're in the process of hopefully getting someone in our program. Yay. Yay, congratulations. That is great news. Thank you. So <clears throat> I am assuming that you're able to review the records or whoever is referring that person fill out a referral that includes diagnostics and 
brief history or what what do you get uh, actually beth gets that other than myself you know I, I'm, I'm not the one who works on that she just asked me to step in on the meeting today and ask that question for her so I'm not certain. I know that she does get the referral and I'm certain that she does um, have access when she goes in there to you know, uh, their chart after they signed a release of information. Carol. I'll jump in and contribute and say, we, we just started, we had our first docket last week. We have one participant, yay. Okay. Um, and, but I have a bunch of referrals in the process and what one of the roadblocks I've kind of come across is when I don't have referral sources that are parents or other family members that have power of attorney or durable medical, things like that, is actually obtaining that consent for treatment, consent for records. Um, and that has been- If you're judged to do it. Creative about that has been difficult, probably. And then this is Taylor with El Paso. Um, we do have about, what, VNA 20 clients. So we just started in August, I believe, but we partnered up with, this, with El Paso Psychiatric Hospital. So that's where we're getting our referrals is um, they're, in the ho they're hospitalized and then when they're ready for discharge, they'll link them up with AOT. And that's how we, that's how we, um, further their process and making sure that they're taking care of their outpatient um, commitment. Thank you. Carol, did you, you had your hand raised? Oh, yes. I was, um, I was just going to share that. I think as we started getting referrals, I would look at that referral to see if there was evidence of criteria being met. And then when I actually did the assessment, I would use that referral uh, or, or the criteria, actually, I developed a, a uh, assessment based on the cr criteria that needed to be met if we, if we went to a hearing. So, so that has always, that's always been the, the guide, just kind of going, one at a time. Of course, if somebody doesn't meet criteria, then once you do the assessment and so on, then we, we look at recommendations for what are the kind of resources we could um, uh, try to engage the person in at, at that time. But from the, from the very beginning uh, with the referral itself, I I would be looking to see if we if we come close to to having um, the criteria needed. Okay, good. Thank you. We always recommend that each program, as you um, start, develop admission criteria. Um, for some of you, your state laws give you a pretty uh, strong set. Um, others, and I believe Florida is one of them, don't have real specifics on admission criteria. Correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. Florida does have pretty specific criteria. It's, it's like New York. So it's a, it it's is. A, yeah. It's, the, the stat the statutes are pretty clear. So um, our admission criteria we utilize in the CSU and one of our local hospitals, um, and that feeds our AOT program. Um, and so the staff have been trained on that and then they have their evaluation so we can demonstrate their failed attempts, which is what the statute states, um, or their non-compliance. Right. And, and that's, that is our admission criteria is really meeting yeah. the statute. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a much easier thing to figure out in states that have those specific criteria the way Florida, New York, California do. Um, it's the places where who qualifies for AOT is more amorphous under the law that programs find themselves needing to establish internal 
uh, admission criteria to figure out exactly how to make sense of the law. So, that, you know, this is just one of those issues that is not an issue everywhere. It just depends on what your state law is like. And, and when we talk about admission criteria, we encourage those who don't live in states that have the, the very specific criteria to use that criteria because it makes sense to do so. Yeah. I mean, it really spells out um, the revolving door that we're trying to prevent people from, from uh, well, to get them out of the revolving door. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> what other, what other questions or concerns or? Well, I have a question then for all of you, and that is, how are you doing with, uh, how are you managing your patients during this really difficult time of COVID? I mean, we, we talked about this, we had a, a discussion about this in April when you know, it was a concern, but it was primarily in the Northeast. Um, but now the whole country's on fire. Um, I know we talked about this with um, <clears throat> from uh, EHN in El Paso, but I'd like to hear from, from you all. How, how are you managing not only your, your clients, but how are you managing to keep yourself safe? And what kind of self-care are you doing? Because this works hard enough without a pandemic. Um, <clears throat> and I know that if, if you don't, you probably have colleagues that um, could be high risk. Um, so if, if you wouldn't mind sharing how you're managing to survive this very difficult time. I'd love to hear it. I, I'll, for myself, I'm trying to keep myself busy at home, um, doing things that interest me. I've found things on Pinterest and doing a lot of crafts. I know that sounds silly, but they kind of keep my mind focused and give me something to do when I'm kind of just sitting at home and decorate for the holidays. And it's, and actually, I've gotten my children involved with it. So they kind of like it. And I don't know, it just kind of gives us all something to do together. And you kind of forget, you know, that you can't really go out for dinner as much and you don't get to do things. And it just, I don't know, it kind of brightens the day. So that's what I'm doing to like self-care and spending time with the family, those things that kind of, you know, get you through it. And then that makes you, and then sometimes I come into work and I share it. <laughs> And I brighten the office and um, it, it kind of gives us all a fun, lightened up atmosphere. So that's what I'm doing. That's great. I'm just curious, are you out in the community? I do. I go out in the community. Um, you know, like I said, we have our first client, so that's good. And then I've also been working with our FAC team here at Centerstone. Mm -hmm. um, um, on my weekends, I still uh, work we usually one or two weekends a month, I work at a crisis stabilization unit as well. So I still go out and work and do that as well. So, mm. yeah. Keeping busy, that's the key. <laughs> yeah. What about other folks? How are you managing and how are your clients managing? Stephanie? You saw me unmute myself. <laughs> I did. I've got my um, eyes. We haven't start a fish. We don't have any clients yet. We're probably going to get them in the next week or two. Um, but prior to this, I was a case manager for adults with mental illness and sometimes had AOT clients. Um, and I had one client that I met with every week for lunch. And we'd go out to a restaurant every week for lunch. And when the pandemic hit Michigan, we shut down. 
So that wasn't an option anymore. So when I would have to call him, we would make lunch together while I was using earbuds or whatever. And we would do it that way so that it was still somewhat of a routine. Um, but that was probably one of the people that I had that struggled the most with it. Is that routine continued to the present day or is that person out of the program or? Um, I'm actually with a different provider now. Oh, okay. I changed jobs. So. Gotcha. <laughs> but he does have a peer support that still does it with him. Some of our patients have struggled with technology um, and not only using it, but um, their concerns with um, who may be listening in and, um, you know, their, their health prohibits them from using it freely. Um, so that's one aspect of it because, uh, you know, we're in a place where we want to keep the patient safe and the staff safe. Um, right. So that's one aspect of it. Um, the other aspect of it, um, I'm in a unique position because I, I work for the county um, with providers, but I am one of the first people in the county that's actually a clinician. So I don't come on as a data person or um, you know, a grants person. They brought me on as an actual behavioral health person to be a liaison. Um, but you also, I see the staff like becoming fatigued from the technology. Like, like they just wanna get out and be with people even though it's not safe. Um, but I also see them going the extraordinary mile to make sure that it happens. No matter what, our hearings happen. Um, and they will go out and spend time with them time and time again. They will teach them how to use it. Um, and, and that work doesn't go unnoticed, you know, not by the patients, not by the families, not by like all of the partners. Um, and, and those are just my observations. It's, it's just amazing work in, in a different way. It's just happening in a different way. Um, so I, um, I was a case manager years ago, and I reflect back on how hard it was to do the work without a pandemic and how important the face-to-face the -face and being able to go and do, do with people, you know, things like, as, as Stephanie said, lunch or just being able to spend time. And, and I just find it amazing that y'all are managing to keep people engaged without having that luxury, I guess. I, I, you know, to me, it was a necessity, but at this point, you're, it's, it's just not possible and you guys are doing awesome work. Um, and, but it, it doesn't always work. We were on the phone yesterday um, with um, El Paso's uh, program manager, and she was talking about a client of theirs who they were just beginning to get to to, to get engaged, and who would participate if if he um, were coming to see the doctor if he, or come to the court if he was transported. Um, and sometimes what you have to do to get people to, because they don't want necessarily to go to court. So having the opportunity, having the, having the ability to bring them in, the important. Um, but since they're not able to do that now, he's, he's away and um, and I think uh, they've uh, discharged him from this program and put him in a, a less intensive program and I guess we'll all see what happens in six months or so if he needs to be stepped up or not but I can I, I would imagine that that's not the only example of that. Yeah, um, so that's that's what I was actually going to bring up. Um, that's one of our cases um, with that individual. 
and he was he honestly um so he struggles with schizophrenia and he was in and out of the justice system regularly and um after he got out of the psych hospital he was actually doing pretty well for himself he found himself a job and vna and i started doing face to faces with him um because because he was struggling with hearing voices, the phone was not working with him at all. We couldn't, we couldn't engage him on the phone. So VNA and I would go to his residence regularly and the sessions would go well, um, but then the cases rose here in El Paso, so we couldn't see him anymore. Um, so he, after, after that, he just, we, he lost contact with us it was very hard for us to engage him via phone call. Um, when I did finally get to talk to him because he had missed three of his court hearings, he he voiced. He said, he said, you know, like I, I want to see you in VNA. I'd rather see you guys in person. Um, so he he enjoyed the face to face, but unfortunately, each time he didn't get to meet with his AO team, AOT team face 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 to face, he deteriorated and um, he ended up in the psych hospital and he's being linked to another um, service provider. But if it wasn't for, unfortunately, if it wasn't for COVID and the cases rising, he probably would have stuck with us and probably would have successfully gone out in, in three months and he would have been okay. But we were struggling with him and taking his medication, but we couldn't, again, we couldn't do the face-to-face -to, -face to teach him how to manage his medication properly. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, anybody else having, first of all, before we do that, I noticed that we have some people who have joined us. Um, Kelly Carmichael, do you want to tell us who you are, what you do, and where you're from? Sure, I can do that. Um, so I'm the clinical team lead for an ACT program here in Las Cruces. And so we work pretty closely with an AOT team. Um, and so I'm coming to join this meeting and be a little bit more a part of that. Excellent. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. And uh, Megan Hebert is also joined us since we started. Yes, I'm sorry. I just took a bite of something. So just give me one oh. second. <laughs> I so relate to that. <laughs> it's happened to me a bunch of times. Sorry, I'm eating rice cakes with peanut butter, so oh, stick totally in your mouth. Take, take longer than usual. That's fine. Um, so I work for Oakland Community Health Network. I, I'm kind of working. So Mac is our uh, Mac Holman is our liaison who manages um, our AOT Kevin's Law. But I've been kind of brought on to help do some data management and assist with how we can try to make some improvements to how we are operating. So I kind of keep sitting in just to kind of learn more information, but really Mac is our, is our go-to guy who does it all. I'm just kind of here learning and trying to see what else we could do to make some improvements. Thank you. And Linda. Hi, I'm just uh, a NAMI advocate and I joined your meeting because I always learn things. So I'm not a clinician, but I, my son will probably be in an AOT program out of uh, Austin in a little bit, maybe months, but I, I just like to kind of keep abreast of things. So I appreciate the invitation to join, but I'm not a clinician. Okay. And then I have iPhone Jeff. He's, he's my husband and he's the same, same situation. We're both retired from the medical profession. Uh, so we find all this interesting and I'm, I'm so glad AOT is around. I figured that uh, you were related somehow. So <laughs> excellent. All right. So I'm curious uh, not to call on people, but I'm going to call on people. Kelly, have you been with the um, ACT program for a while? Because Cruces just finished their grant, correct? doing AOT for four years? Yeah, I've been with ACT for a little over two years. Um, but yes, the grant did just end at the end of November. 
Um, so I think that we're still trying to figure out all those logistics and what that's going to exactly look like moving forward. But my understanding that we are at minimum moving forward with patients who were already in AOT and their um, time in the program is not completed. So have you, have you noticed any um, difficulties with or um, people who have backslid because of the pandemic and your inability to provide the range of services that you had pre-pandemic? Yeah, I would say it's kind of come in waves. Like we've had periods where, you know, we'll see a spike in hospitalization because patients, uh, kind of like what you were talking about earlier, like I think a lot of it comes down to they don't have that human contact. For some of them, they really enjoyed like some of the groups that we offered, being able to get out of their house and get out into the community, like go to the library um, or even go to like the parks and they can't do that anymore. And so I think it was probably like, May-ish that we saw a really big spike where a lot of our patients ended up in the hospital because it just got to be too much for them. Um, and it's kind of leveled out. And then we saw a little bit more of a spike, you know, whenever they did the ne that next lockdown. I want to, I don't even remember now, maybe in October. Um, so it's come in waves. Um, and I can tell that they, they miss some of the services that we provided. I hear about the groups the most, um, but they miss seeing us too. You know, as a, I, I'm, Part, part supervisor, part therapist. And, you know, some of my clients are like, am I ever going to see you for therapy again? Or is it just going to be telehealth forever? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't have that answer. But um, to answer your question, yeah, I, we've seen it and it, it comes in waves. Yeah. That, uh, <clears throat> that, that whole question about whether telehealth is here to stay. I think it is, but to the extent that we'll be using it, it's really an interesting question. Um, I think I've read where there's higher, um, higher adherence with psychiatric appointments using telehealth than with in-person appointments. Um, is that what you're seeing with your clients? For some of them, it really depends. Like some of our population, considering we're an ACT program, um, some of them just don't have phones. So it really doesn't matter. It actually makes it more of a hindrance because it's easier for me to go out and find them versus trying to get them a phone and then have them keep the phone and not something happen. Um, but some of them are, yeah, I would say like more active in the sense where it's so much easier for them to just pick up their phone. So it really just depends on the patient. So what about some others of you who, I know you're in new AOT programs, but what about your past experience? You may be new to the AOT programs, but you've been in other um, case management roles in the past or other therapeutic roles. Um, so I am new to, I'm sorry. That's okay, go ahead. I am new to the AOT program, but I am not new to case management as I'm a mental health um, case manager. Um, so in the past, in my past role, it's been easier for like the telephone calls, the duos, the Zooms, things of that nature to um, keep in contact with my um, consumers. Um, I think overall as an agency, we're doing okay. Um, I, my caseload that I just came away from, I didn't have a lot of um, hospitalizations. So, um, and overall, we like work as we have individual supervisors, but it's, it's like one big team. So overall, I didn't hear of like a lot of hospitalizations. I mean, at one point we were calling our consumers weekly. So I think we're doing good. Um, as for myself, I found so much stuff to do that I wasn't doing working. So I have plenty of projects to do. And then with Christmas time coming, hey, <laughs> wrapping gifts, um, ordering things. So yeah, I'm staying busy. Good, good. So I had some similar experiences in my last role is actually in a nursing home during therapy. And of course, all of that came crashing down during 
COVID and we, we tried working with the homes to offer telehealth, but it's just, there's so many barriers, so many challenges to that, especially, you know, when you come up with a geriatric population and there's hearing difficulties. Um, they, and a lot of them adapted really well, which was wonderful, but there's still so many difficulties. I've been impressed in this role here how, how adaptable everybody has been. So Texas is still warm. Like I went outside earlier without a coat on, it was fine. So a lot of our people that maybe the technology just doesn't work for them, um, our case managers will still go out and see them outside. Like they'll sit outside, they'll bring a chair. I even visited with one and he had like built a little table for when his case manager came so they could have their little sessions outside. It was really touching and wonderful. So I've been impressed by that. And I feel like Pecan Valley has been really supportive. Um, if anybody needs PPE, they provide it. I mean, anything they can do, they're trying to get us vaccines. Um, so I, I feel like if somebody has like a concern about COVID or about safety, that they would be there to, to provide support and to try to brainstorm, how are we gonna help our people but keep ourselves safe? And they've, I mean, they've done things like dropping off medications in people's mailboxes and waiting in their cars while they come out to get it so that it's, you know, a little safer for everybody. Um, I'm ready for it to be over. <laughs> Not me. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm ready for to see people in person again without the mask on. And right now I'm, I'm helping out with our diagnostic assessments. And it's all telephonic, which is convenient for me because I don't have to drive all over six counties, but it can, it presents with problems. Like today my call dropped like three times in the middle of an assessment, which is just disruptive. And it's very difficult for people who can't see me in my face to want to talk, tell me all, you know, things that might be hard to tell someone anyway. So that's, that's what we're working with. Yeah, not only that, but it's, I would think it would be very difficult to do a diagnostic assessment without being able to see the person. I mean, yeah, my, my confidence is not 100% <laughs> in what I come up with. Yeah, I mean, there's things that you can see that you wouldn't be able to notice over the phone and really mm -hmm. important indicators, so. Mm-hmm. So I have, um, I'm, a, I'm an LPC. Uh, my role has kind of switched, whereas I have background experience working in the inpatient setting. I did that for about six years um, and also private practice. And um, I've switched over to working on the court side of things. So it, it sounds like there are a number of people here who do more of the case management stuff. So I was wondering um, from some of you guys, what uh, what's the frequency that you would normally go? Maybe like pre-pandemic and then now as far as like seeing your the patients or clients um, in that interaction, uh, is it something that is a, on a daily basis? Is it something that is w once a week or, you know, what what does that look like? I guess I can only speak to what it was before the AOT program because I haven't been, we haven't had clients yet. Um, I know that our current supervisor is encouraging us to check in at least two to three times a week with the upcoming clients. Um, but previously I had clients that I was supposed to see once a month and I was calling them once a week because they were, they were normally someone who was very, very stable and they were just struggling. And that, and you said that was before you started into AOT. Okay, but post pandemic. I mean, but during the pandemic. I know, and again, this is speaking from the court side because I don't do the case management piece. Um, but I know that a number of the 
the clients we have in our program. Initially, starting out, um, we had the case managers having some sort of communication with them on a daily basis. And I know that some of our uh, consumers were not always very pleased about that. They felt like we were too much involved and they wanted a little bit of space and a little bit of freedom. Um, so now that's something that we're trying to adjust and figure out with our program is um, kind of where do we draw that line and, and make it individualized with each patient. You know, some patients uh, we've been trying to spread that out a little bit more, but I didn't know if if anyone else had any insight as to what worked with them as far as like a basis of maybe this is what they started with and kind of assessed from there. Because I, I, I know it is very individualized for each person in their So prior to the pandemic, we, our consumers are seen by levels. So each consumer has a level of care, depending on the higher the number, typically the more you see them in case they were like in like a specialized AFC or something like that. So it just really depends on their level of care, their need. So somebody that's like, say, a level like a two, which is a low number, we might see them, we might conversate with them via phone or something, but actually see them, we might see them like um, quarterly because they don't, they don't need much because they're, they're at that point where they're about to transition to community-based services. So it just depends on, you know, the severity of their mental illness for us. For your program, is it generally the doctors who assess what level of care they need? Is it, the, is it you as the caseworker? Um, is it something that you all kind of come up with as a treatment team? How does, what does that look like? They get assessed in, when they do their intake. They, we have like a, um, I don't know if other programs have, but we have like a locus program that um, where we do a locus and locus just basically talks about their, their needs kind of. And um, that's how they determine how they place them. So we don't do that, no. So it's done in intake before they even get to us. Their level is determined. However, if, if, if I get them as a case manager and realize like, hey, they were um, assessed at a level four and clearly they could be a three or a two, I can take them down at any time based upon how well they do in our program. Is that locus intake done in, in the hospital? No, it's done in our building. Out. It's done in agency. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the locus is a, uh, um, a well-known, it stands for level of care utilization screen, I think, screen. I don't mm -hmm. know what the BS is, but it's level of care utilization. So I lot, think it is screen. Yeah, a lot of organizations use that. It's on the internet. So you can, um, you can take a look at it yourself. Um, I think that... Uh, and especially for the, the new SAMHSA programs that just um, receive grants that they pretty much uh, think that those or they propose ACT teams because a lot of the literature talks about um, how AOT folks are in ACT programs. So in New York, for example, where we have our most robust data, they were either in intensive case management or ACT. Um, but it's been my experience and there's more research, recent research that shows that not everybody in AOT needs an intensive level of services. I've had people on AOT when I was a case manager who needed basically that monthly check-in and not much more, monthly um, visit with a psychiatrist, um, phone calls here and there, but they didn't need the, they didn't, their ADLs and um, IADLs were, were good enough that they could manage uh, living independently in an apartment um, without much intervention. Um, but they, 
absolutely needed that court order to continue to take their medicine. I mean, they, they relied on that. So um, I think it's really important that you take a look and, and assess your, your client's needs and um, target your interventions to that. Because I, I worry what I, uh, I worry about pushing people away with too many interventions. As, as you were saying, Mary, people were like, enough already. Um, and that's what we've noticed. We've had an, a, a, a few uh, patients that come in and they're just like, I'm tired of being called all the time. I'm tired of always having to be at this thing and that thing and this thing because we initially have gone in so intensely um, and now we're kind of hearing that maybe we should take a couple steps. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's real common to um, need to provide intensive services up front, you know, especially someone who hasn't been stable in a while and they're finally responding to medication. Um, they could use a lot of support up front, but you know, as that medication begins to take hold, as um, whatever living situation they're in, they, they get used to that. Um, they could, I mean, I think it's important to do locus, whether you use the locus tool or, um, some other locally developed, but take a look at what their their needs are. I mean, I think we're we're required to assess the the folks we serve. Uh, if we're billing Medicaid, we're required to assess those needs on a on a fairly frequent basis, and we should make our treatment recommendations accordingly. Um, I just wanted to pipe in for just a second. The um, I think it's important not only to base it on what their needs are, but I think it's important to remember that their needs may change. Um, mm -hmm. I had a client that I she was very belligerent with me on the phone um, when the pandemic first started, and I called me everything but my actual name. And then I'd call her two to three times a week, no answer. Two to three times a week, no answer. And then about a month and a half into the pandemic, I called her, or she called me and said, I didn't know anybody else to call. You're the only one who ever calls me. So it's, it's, it's really important to keep at least some sort of communication open, even if they're resistant at the beginning. And, you know, I, I've, had a, I've had clients where, you know, they, they decompensate, um, they end up hospitalized or end up that, that I'm um, a big part of the reason they get hospitalized and I'm the last person they want to see. I, and as Stephanie, you get called every name in the book. My favorite is Four-Eyed Monkey Bitch. Nobody's ever been able to top that one. Um, but as, as they, uh, again, as they start to respond to, to medication, I mean, you can build that relationship back up. I have, I, I can't even remember a time where the case management relationship was totally uh, severed by uh, an involuntary hospitalization. It may start that way, but with time, um, it gets better. And because of that, um, so the, the case that uh, called me names, even though she had just been released from the hospital, I gave her some space. You know, I made sure that her needs were met. You know, I could 
talk with her. Um, she was living with her family so I could talk with her family and make sure that she was okay, but give her some space so that she um, had time to kind of simmer down and um, the meds, of course, take the edge off if they're, if they're working, so. I think that's helpful and that, and hopefully it'll continue to get better now that we're learning and adjusting. So thank you. Good. And VNA who, who has trouble to make, doesn't have a microphone. I don't know if you saw that in the chat. She said that they, they split it up so they're not hearing from the same person. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's a really great idea too. I mean, after all, ACT is a, is, a, is a team sport where you're all supposed to, you know, the whole treatment team engages with each client. If you are using the ACT model, please raise your hand. Yeah. So yeah, so getting to know everybody and having different people to talk to, I think is really important. Yeah. So I have, um, I have a, a, just a couple of comments about, about that. And I, I really appreciate, um, what a number of people have said. I, one of the things that comes to mind for me is kind of what you were talking about, Amy, is that the, um, the uh, initially we want we want to structure things. So there's a sense of of, of uh, an individual uh, coming to some predictability about what's happening next, especially when they're really struggling with things. So a sense of sort of being held and, um, uh, you know, in the, in the courtroom, certainly uh, I cared about the, you know, the team uh, is in, involved and the person experiences that care, whether or not they're embracing it or not, um, that's, that's something different. And of course, these days it's virtual. I mean, there's you know, we have the 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 teams meet, you know, in in on online and it's Zoom and it's 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 a little different. But I think that the structure of it basically is predictable and that uh, and dependable. Um, one of the things about people that are referred is that there is not one person the same. We can't say that they're all the same because everybody comes in with different issues. And so what has to happen is that it has to be individualized. And what drives that treatment is that treatment plan, which, which together with the individual we write, right? So, and then in court, the, the judge looks at that and the team looks at that and says, is this what's gonna work for you? If it doesn't, we, we need to be um, in that place where there's some flexibility. We need to let go of something. We maybe need to build something else in. But um, there was a question about how often how often does that look? Well, for some people, it may need that they mean they need some assistance with medication, medication outreach every day. So basically, they're going to have some level of in this, you know, in the time we we are uh, navigating right now, that is um, the protocol around that is very specific, depending on all of the circumstances. Uh, but some people have contact every single day. Other people are doing really well. They're kind of beyond that initial um, period where. Uh, there's more of a impending crisis, you know. Now they're they're doing much better. 
we don't need to have that level of intensity. So the intensity of services in response to where people are is, is um, it changes. And, and I think that, that um, that's, that's really important to kind of keep that open. And the other piece is that this is a collaboration from the get-go, from the very first uh, uh, of working with um, uh, these individuals that we're privileged to serve. Um, it is a collaboration. We want to hear from them what they need. We talk about how what that might look like. Uh, we talk about their goals. Sometimes we don't talk about anything until we get to court, and then the conversation can start. Um, but even then, it's a collaboration, so that when um, uh, people are able to take the, those steps by themselves, they are empowered to do so. They've been included on a conversation from the very beginning. So I, I think in the predictability, certainly, but but um, there's there's a lot of things that I think we learn from the individuals that are referred to us. You know, they're going to help us to know and to learn what we need to do to help to help them. Um, but those just some thoughts I I had listening to you, Amy and Mary and Stephanie and. And yes, being called every name in the book and remembering what some of those are, that's, um, you know, that's something we, we do carry with us. But happy for what we see on the other side, the, the outcome, the recovery, the people thriving once again. Thank you so much for that. And you know, as I, as I think about it and think about AOT and how really it's a collaboration even, even before you get the program started. So it, you know, it starts as a, a community collaboration. And then as, as you begin to get it off the ground and have, have um, participants, um, it's a, it's a collaboration between the treatment team, just as Carol said, treatment team and the participant, client, consumer, whatever you, you call that person. Or as I, I love the way Carol put it, you know, the, the people we are privileged to serve. And um, so... Any other questions, comments? I do have a question. So we're, we're looking at getting somebody into AOT. He is very motivated. Um, I think what appeals to him is that he is going to get all these services at, at no cost to him. It's going to be so much more convenient than having to, to drive out to the Metroplex, which is great for you know, we want to meet him where he's at. What if we put in the court order and the judge says no, that they disagree and he he's not court ordered to AOT? What do we do then? So if both parties are agreeing that he meets the criteria, that is, if you as the petitioner says we say this person meets the criteria, the respondent agrees they meet the criteria, there's really nothing for the judge to rule on. Right, the judge can just enter a stipulated order at that point because the person is saying, yes, I do meet these criteria. There are no facts in dispute. Um, the judge is not gonna jump in on top of something like that and try and break up an agreement that you all have reached. Um, so I, th I don't think you have to worry about that. Thanks. Yeah. I always think of like the worst that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> it might make me feel better. <laughs> I can't, I can't remember if your public defenders were. Um, that was in uh, in Florida, yeah. In, uh, well, I, it was other place too, and I can't remember where else, but. Yeah, you're Pecan Valley, right, Whitney? Yeah, I don't yeah. think. It was, uh, I don't think yeah, it they seemed really on board. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. We have a couple of places where the PK, where the public defenders told us they're going to try and talk their clients out of agreeing. <laughs> so, 
I don't uh, think anybody said that in our yeah, meetings. Good. It's, it's, good, it's, good. it's really un <laughs> so unfortunate. Yeah. It, uh, you know, perversion of the role of, of their attorney. Mm -hmm. So. But. Thanks for putting my mind at ease, Brian. Sure. That has, just out of curiosity, has anyone experienced that where the judge has told them, has denied um, a commitment? Do you mean in a case where the person, is, the, the respondent is challenging it and the court turns it down because they agree with the respondent that the person doesn't meet criteria? Yeah, or I guess just in general, like even if the, if the patient is agreeable, wants to participate and the judge for yeah. whatever, or maybe the county attorney doesn't feel like it's it meets statute to pursue. I don't know. Again, they've got to do what their client says. If the person is agreeing if they want it and their attorney hasn't been able to talk them out of it, there really isn't. I mean, the attorney can't make decisions for their client that, you know, like that. Um, they can't overrule their own client. So if they're, if, if both parties want it, the judge just doesn't have an opportunity to overrule it. As long as they meet the statute. So someone who doesn't have the number of hospitalizations and doesn't, doesn't necessarily meet criteria. Yeah, yeah. But if the person, you know, if the judge brings the person into court and says, okay, now you agree that you meet all these criteria, you have these hospitals, you know, if the person is saying, yes, I do, um, the judge is not going to go beyond that. On the other end of that, what you were mentioning, Brian, have you had a patient who was contesting it, who wanted to attend in court uh, to appear? Oh, sure, that happens. That happens. Uh, it's not. It's not common, but it ha has anyone had that experience of having a petition overruled? Definitely, here. Died. Yeah. Um, not overruled, yeah. but I've had it where it's been contested. But, but ultimately it was granted by the court, not denied by the court? He, he was re responding to internal stimuli during the meeting. So, yeah. 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 Um, we Carol, have, you've been, you, yeah, you've been yeah, involved a long time. Yeah, we've you know. testified numerous times where we've had um, someone that contests it. So it goes from a, the hearing to a, um, a, a formal proceeding. And, and uh, then that's when the, the, the things shift a little bit. The, the defense attorney or the um, public defender then has to kind of shift gears, change hats a little bit to, to really try to um, support the client in not having to be ordered. However, the judge then um, goes through all of the criteria, um, the, takes testimony uh, around why and any compelling evidence that shows that all the criteria are met. Once all of that is done, then the, the judge makes a determination. So that happens, I, I, I would say mostly there's a settlement agreement um, but it's a settlement agreement or it's a court order that is determined um, following a contested hearing. And Carol, have you ever seen a contested hearing result in a denial of the petition? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, it certainly does happen. We have a small group here, but I've heard of it. <laughs> I, I have been involved in that. It was okay. a very odd case and it was, uh, I think it was more political than anything else. And it was a brand new program. It was the, the only case in the county. Um, but I have seen it, um, but very rarely. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, if, if the prosecutor or whatever you want to call that person is able to prove by clear and convincing evidence that the person is mentally ill, person does meet the criteria, then really the judge shouldn't be, shouldn't be saying, well, I don't think that's a good idea. 
Yeah, you know, under every state's criteria, there are subjective factors and objective factors. The objective factors are, you know, how many has the person been hospitalized? Have they been diagnosed with a mental illness? Have they had the right number of hospitalizations? It's going to be highly unusual for someone to come into court without getting those objective factors in place. I mean, you know, you, that you just wouldn't go into a contested hearing if you didn't have proof that the person met the objective factors. And the subjective part, you know, it comes out of the testimony of the clinician who's who's supporting the petition and you know not, not too many judges are going to uh, substitute their judgment for that of a clinical professional so you know that makes these card cases pretty easy to win now that the person may come with their own expert testimony a lot of states say that you have a right to a free independent examination and it's certainly possible that you could have a dueling experts one saying I think he meets criteria the other not and then the judge will have to pick who they find more credible not too common. I think um, more concerning than the judges are these, I don't know what you want to call them, the, the, uh, the public defenders or the that are trying to, um, we're not on board. I mean, that's more of a concern than Judges, I think. Yeah, they can really they have a uh, can really muck up the process by you know saying the wrong things to their client once the court order is in place. Uh, you know that's something we worry about with public defenders sometimes is that they're going to tell people, well, this order doesn't really have a lot of teeth. It can't really you can't be in trouble for violating it, so don't worry about it. Um, you know the. the it's important that they explain to their clients that they're not going to be in trouble if they violate the order. We don't want them to lie, but you know, we also want them to encourage their client to take this very seriously and use it as an opportunity to get some help. And I think for the most part they do. Yeah. I think that unusual to have yeah. um, contrary uh, defenders. At any rate, any last words? All right. Well, happy holidays, everybody. Yeah, I hope you all. Happy holidays to you as well. I hope you all get a, a little break. <laughs>